If you don't like what I'm preaching, you can just keep on reading where we're at and the Lord, Lord will speak to your heart. I've done that many a time and I completely understand that. But uh, we're going to start there at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse of Joseph before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Joseph was a good man. Because whenever he found out that his wife-to-be, we would call her his fiance, but the, the Bible call it, uh, refers to her as his wife here. That's the way they did back in those days. She, that, she was his wife. They just hadn't consummated the marriage yet. What happened was he found out she's pregnant. Well, he knew he, knew he hadn't been with her. So under the law, the Jewish law, he could have made a public example. He could have brought her before the judges and said, Hey, this girl here, I was going to marry her. We're married. We had not we hadn't had the marriage feast yet. And she's already pregnant. She's obviously been with somebody. They could have stoned her and put her to death. But Joseph was a just man. He loved Mary. He didn't want to make an example. You know how brokenhearted he must have been? And he said, You know what? I love her. I, you know, and she's trying to tell me something. Yeah, that's... You know. <laughs> Yeah, God came in, and now you, you're pregnant now. Yeah, uh-huh. You know, there's no all kinds. You know, you know how the devil must have worked with his mind. But he said, well, I'll just put her away privately. You know, he just wants to, he just wants to do the right thing by her because he loves her. It's obvious that he loves her. Verse 20, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So the Lord through a dream and an angel through a dream convinces him, hey, you know, what she's saying is true. That's what's going on. Verse 21, though, this is what I want to focus on this morning. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now Jesus means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. J-E is the short abbreviation for Jehovah. Sus is saves. So when you say Jesus, you're saying Jehovah saves. That's what he is. That's his whole incarnation. When God incarnated into Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, his whole purpose wasn't to come down here just to heal a bunch of folks, to heal the blind, and to, to teach us some good teachings, and to show us how we should live. Jesus Christ's purpose, being incarnated as a virgin, was to come in here and to die for your sins. When I say you, I'm talking about everybody. Everybody on the sound of my voice. It's your sins. That includes my sins. They call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you humbly in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray, Lord, you'd hide me behind the cross and... Lord, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will lead us, guide us this morning, Lord God. I pray, Father, and I know in this country, Lord Jesus, you're not welcome in a lot of places, but here this morning, Lord Jesus, we welcome you, Lord. We invite you to come in, Lord, reside with us, sit down, Lord God. Uh, dwell among us, Lord God, as we sit at your feet, Lord. And I pray, Father, that these words, Lord, that we're reading out of your book will be like holy manna coming down from heaven, that we might feast off of them, Lord, and be full. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation, Lord. Thank you for saving me from my sins. And Lord, thank you for saving you, saving the saving uh, my friends and my and my my uh, my relatives and just some people, all, everybody in the world. Lord, thank you for saving them from their sins, Lord God. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. So it says there that He saves His people, saves His people from their sins. See, your sins are out to destroy you. Your sins are out to destroy you. Your sins. We're out to destroy you. They're out to destroy you. It's, we, we know, and it's okay, and it's proper to say, hey, I was saved from hell. Because when you say saved, you're implying that, that you were doomed. You were saved, like if you're saved off of a boat, or you're saved from a burning fire, or you're saved, yeah, I was saved. You're, you're saying that there was something bad was about to happen to you, and somebody rescued you. So Jesus Christ, he's the rescuer. He's the one that's going to give you the rope. He's the one that's going to, he's the one that's going to save you, and he's going to save you from hell. And it's proper to say that, because we were bound and doomed and bound to go to hell. But you've got to understand, the reason why you were going to go to hell was because of your sins. Your sins. Not, oh, my mom was bad, or my dad was bad. or no, That's what's wrong with the world. Nobody wants to own up to it that they're a sinner. 
And I was just witnessing to a, a man this morning, and uh, we, we pulled over and was talking to him, and I was asking, to, asking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and what came across to me was he's very self-righteous. He was very self-righteous, and I got that self-righteousness out of him. Now, I didn't have time to really get, get deep with him, but I, I could see there was self-righteousness there. What, what, what do you mean, Brother King? That he doesn't know he's a sinner. And that's what you get, got going on in the world. Well, I'm not as bad as my neighbor. I'm not as bad as my co-worker. I'm not as, we're all sinners. Amen. Now, some of us got a lot more sin. And I'm going to tell you something else. Being a pastor and dealing with people, there's a lot more sin in the world and in this church than a lot of y'all know about. And I know it just because I'm the pastor and I get to talk to people. That's why there's nothing that surprises me. When I first, when I first got in the ministry 18 years ago, I remember sitting down and this, this man was we were sitting across the dinner table and we were talking and, and he's, he's a good Christian man at church, loved the Lord, did everything. He said, you know, blah, 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 blah. He told me something about himself and my jaw just went, you know, like. It's been a long 18 years. I'm not a Catholic priest, but I get confessed to a lot. And what, I, what the Lord has shown me in that is not that, hey, y'all people are bad, and this per, I've got all this dirt on everybody. You know what the Lord has shown me? Everybody's got problems. Everybody's a sinner. There's just, other, there's just some people good at hiding it. And sometimes their sins don't hit the local newspaper. Amen? But I'm telling you what, if, if sin was a stink, if, if sin caused stink in your life, a, a physical aroma stink, we'd have to open up these windows. Yeah, we couldn't stay in here. We'd everybody would be for breeze everywhere. <laughs> Stinks. So don't, don't sit back there and say, oh, the pastor's judging me. I'm not judging anybody. I, I, I've got dirt on everybody. The Lord's got dirt on everybody. Because everybody's a sinner. And don't feel bad. Everybody's a sinner. You get up there and you're saying, well, look at the way he's dressed. Look at the way they're wearing a tire. You see a guy driving around a nice vehicle and you see these people. You know, they're a doctor or whatever. Hey, guys, they got the same sins as you have. I know of a lady that uh, her son was having all kinds of trouble. I mean, man, all kinds of trouble. So you know what they did? They, they, they arrested him. And in the local newspaper, they would, they would put a blotter out and all the arrests. You know, they arrested somebody for marijuana, they arrested somebody for meth, they arrested, you know, some beating his wife. What, you know how they do all that? Just, just a police blotter. She called up the paper, and she got him on the phone, got the other phone. You're not going to put his name in the paper. Well, ma'am, we, we, uh, we do this, and it's just part of a police blotter. You understand who I am? You know who I am? You're not going to put his name in the paper. Guess what? His name didn't go in the paper. But that poor old so-and-so down there that's just trying to make a living down at Kohler, his son got in trouble. You know his son got put in the paper. Yeah. Amen. And then so that way, when they go to their next social function, when that person goes to the next social function, they look like a good, outstanding family. They, and their kids are good. Their kids don't do anything wrong. Oh, man, go kid your mama. <laughs> I know the truth. We all know the truth. We're all sinners. And Jesus Christ, praise God, he came to save sinners. Amen. He came to save those that have sin. He saved his people from their sins, our sins. Somebody could go and say, hey, I was on the Titanic, and I've heard, I love the story of the Titanic. And I love to hear stories of survivors of the Titanic. And you'll hear stories, and they'll say, I was saved from the Titanic. I mean, I think that would, that'd be amazing. There's nobody alive today who could say that. But if somebody was alive today, they'll say, hey, I, I was saved from the Titanic. Oh, well, tell me what all happened. But really what they're saying is they weren't saved from the Titanic. They were saved from drowning in an ocean grave is what they were saved from. And that's what I'm saying. You, it's, it's, it's proper to say you're saved from hell, but what you understand, that iceberg hit that Titanic and sank the Titanic. The iceberg's what caused the sinking of the Titanic. That iceberg. That iceberg's your sins. That iceberg's your sins. And it's proper to say you're going to hell, but what's, going, what's sending you to hell is your sins. It's your sins are sending you to hell. That's exactly what's sending you to hell. For he shall save his people from their sins. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. So I think we've got all that established this morning that we're all sinners, praise the Lord. We're all sinners. Even if you're a born-again believer in this church or in, in Jesus Christ and you're sitting in this church this morning, you're still a sinner. We all have sin in us. And I hate to, hate to tell you that. You're not, you've not reached perfection. Nobody in here has reached perfection. We're striving. 
Maybe you might be a little bit more righteous than you were. Praise God. We try not to sin, but we all have sin in us. And we talked about that this morning in Sunday school. That's why our body's going to go in a grave, because God hates this body. It's full of sin. It's going to go in a grave. You're not fully redeemed until you get rid of this body. Until, this, until your soul can split from this body and get out of this cocoon, this sinful flesh, you're not fully redeemed. And whenever God gives you that new body, and he's going to give it to us at the rapture, that's why it says that those that are alive will be changed in a moment, a twinkle of an eye. And if your body's laying in that grave, Christ brings, those, brings you with him at the rapture. He raises your body up. Your soul goes in that new body. The Bible calls it incorruptible. The Bible calls it immortal. The Bible calls it you'll never sin again. And that's what we want. Because what Paul teaches, Paul says, in your body, like in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That blood running through you is sinful. That blood's got the sin in it. And that's why you're a sinner. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be there at, be there at verse 9. We're going to be there at verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be there, be there at, at verse 9. Now, guys, when I was talking about the Titanic, what, the point I'm trying to make about the Titanic is people who got on the Titanic, they got on the Titanic, and the, life was good, they were living the dream, nothing, and, and they, a lot of them believed there was no way that boat could ever sink. Now, the, the rumor is that the captain said God himself couldn't, sh couldn't sink this ship. Now, they, they claim that's not true. It might be true. Who knows? But the majority of people believe this ship, ship was unsinkable. And that's where a lot of people live their lives. Young people are real bad about it. They live like they're Superman. Nothing can harm me. I'm never going to run into troubles. And they're just living wild, sowing their oats, living like they're never going to have to reap what they sow. And the Bible tells us you will reap what you sow. And they live that. And then when we get older, then that's when we start reaping in all this that we live. And that's where people are. They're on their, t their ship of Titanic. Everything's going great until you hit that iceberg. And I'm telling you, that iceberg is your sin. And that sin, for the wages of sin is death. That's why we're all going to die in here because of sin in us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is the, is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, that's the gift. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Let's move along. Get to the point. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. That's the people that want to be rich. Will be rich. That's those people that have a will to be rich. Those are the people that are trying to, to, play, to play in the lottery because they're hoping if you get that $200 million. There's the people that are uh, gambling, trying to get that $200 million. Those people do anything, work overtime, anytime, day or night. They do anything to get money. It's all about money. Their, their whole life's about money. Those that will be rich will, uh, fall into temptation and snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. And that's exactly what's going on in America today. Because it's all about money, how much money you have, how much money you can make, how much money you can spend. Do you have enough money? You need to make more money. And you'll have a, I've seen men that will make, will make decent wages at a job that they like, will see a job that pays them maybe $3 more an hour, and they'll leave that job that they really like and they're comfortable with, and they'll go to try to make that extra $3 an hour. Miserable, hate it, and they're coming, they come right back. Can I have my job back? That it, you, they realize it's not, money, does, money doesn't mean everything. Look at verse, the end of verse 9. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. There's that drowning again. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not the root of all evil. Love of money is the root of all evil. Money's okay, guys. You've got to have money. You've got to spend money. Money's okay. It's the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's everything. Most of what you turn on, the TV preachers, it's all about the love of money. It's all about having more money and God blessing you. And it says they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You want to be a sorrowful Christian? Just worry about money all the time. Just your whole life should be focused on money. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Flee these things. Oh, let me read it again. But thou, O man of God, when it says O man of God, everybody in here that's a born-again Christian, flee these things. Run from them. Escape. Flee. Get away. Run from them. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, 
meekness. Forget about money, forget about but they flee these things. And I'm, I'm, what I'm pointing out to you is, is, is Paul, and I'm going to show you some other scriptures in a couple of minutes, is going to teach you something about sin. And what he's teaching you about sin is, when sin presents itself to you, you need to run. <laughs> Flee. Take off running. Just run as fast as you can. Why? Because sin will send you to hell. It was sin that was going to send you to hell. So I was reading this story, and I read some old Puritans. Now, the old Puritans, they don't believe the Bible exactly like I, I doctrinally believe the Bible, but I love the old Puritans because they love God, they love Jesus Christ, and they shot it straight. I just like people shooting it straight, you know. And this Puritan, his name was Joseph Mead. He was telling a story about him and this lady were walking in this garden, and they were walking along, and as they walked in this garden, they came across this beautiful rose bush. He says one of the most beautiful rose bushes you can imagine. And he said, but there was one rose on that bush that was more beautiful than all the other roses. And as they looked at that bush, that woman says, I think I want that rose. And she walked over there and she reached in there to grab that rose and a big black snake coiled up around her arm. And she, ah, like most of us, I probably would have passed out and died. But she went, ah. And he said she screamed through and that snake fell off her arm and she, <laughs> she fleed and fleed and fleed. <laughs> Screaming. And he said in his account, she went into convulsions. <laughs> <laughs> she had a real phobia. And from that moment on, he said she hated snakes. She detested snakes. She had an incredible fear of snakes. And you couldn't drag her around a bush. <laughs> right? She had a phobia. What is a phobia? A phobia is an overwhelming or debilitating fear, usually of something that poses no real danger at all. If it does pose some danger, the person's response is usually out of proportion to the actual danger it possesses. People who have a phobia are generally aware that their fear is irrational, they will nonetheless experience severe anxiety upon exposure to their phobia. Most of us have phobias in here, right? I think most of us would admit that we have phobias in here. I'm going to read you some of these phobias. Acrophobia is a fear of heights. Some of us in here have a fear of heights. That's called acrophobia. Areophobia is a fear of flying. See, I didn't know I had that. I didn't know I had a fear of flying until I hit turbulence on my first plane trip coming from Pensacola to Houston. I was down there, and I sat down, and okay, everything's okay. I mean, whoa, plane glows up, and I'll never, there's a Spanish guy sitting next to me, and he had headphones on. And I remember sitting there on the, in the chair, and all of a sudden, the plane does that. I'm like, what was that? And then, this is your captain speaking. If you look over to the left, you'll see a beautiful light show as the thunderstorms come rolling in. We will experience some turbulence. And it, but isn't that beautiful to the left as you see the light show? You know, and I look out my window and I see, you know, the lightning. And I'm like, it is kind of beautiful. And then, and then, and then right about that time, my, and this is no exaggeration. God is my witness. My whole body went, I went directly into sweat from the top to the bottom of my feet. The bottom of my feet were sweating. I didn't know my bottom of my feet could sweat. My whole, my pants were soaked. And, and like this, if this was the edge of the seat, I probably put an indention there where my fingers went. <laughs> and I just, just I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. God, if you get me off this plane, I, I'll never get on a plane again. I'm going to die. And I remember kind of looking over at that guy, and he's over there just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> how can you be that way? You know, like, oh, oh. and I mean, I remember when we finally landed, and I was like, oh, praise God. And I remember going into the bathroom, and, and I got uh, all these, you know, those paper towels, and I wet them all down, and I took a shower right there, because I just sweated, you know. My next, I had to get back on a plane to get to Brownwood. I got two hours layover. That's the longest, hardest prayer I've prayed. Lord, I can't get on this plane. You've got to help me get on this plane. Lord, you've got to help me get I can't get on this plane. I was just completely, insanely scared of getting on a plane. And finally, they got, I got on the plane and you get settled down. I get on the plane and I'm like, I think I can make this. And while I'm on the plane, while I'm on the plane sitting, we're about to take off again and I'm finally relaxed. Here comes the pilot of the plane. He looks like he's 17 years old. Comes walking in. <laughs> pimples and everything. I'm like, no, no. 
Like, I don't want the 17-year-old flying the plane. I want the guy, I want the guy flying the plane that's the, the veteran from, you know, like Vietnam, has an eye patch, you know, been shot down by Charlie, you know, knows how to get us through it. I don't want the 17-year-old kid, you know, I just got through playing my Xbox. Now let's go, you know. So, you know. But God, God, is, God is gracious, and I was able to get through that. Agoraphobia, fear of public spaces of crowds. There's a lot of that goes on. Agoraphobia, I think, what was her name? Uh, we saw her, and that, that actress had that. Yeah, Kim Basinger. She had that really bad. She couldn't be around crowds. Arachnophobia, of course, is the fear of spiders. Claustrophobia, fear of, of tight spaces. Dentophobia, fear of dentist. Driving phobia, fear of driving. It's amazing how all these phobias, I didn't know there's something like androphobia, a fear of men. I didn't know that even existed. There's a, a thing called gynophobia, a fear of women. And that, that's nothing wrong with that one. Back to... <laughs> any of y'all in here been married and divorced? Amen. Bacteriophobia, the first of fear of bacteria. And we know that there's a lot of that going on. Pogo, pog, pogonophobia. Anybody know what that is? Pogonophobia? That's a fear of beards. Why are you afraid of beards? But there's people. My point is, is that from studying this out, I got to realizing that most of that fear comes from an experience in childhood or experience in life, right? That's why, you, you know, like once bitten, twice shy. You've had something happen to you now, you're like, I don't like dogs. You know, fear of dogs or fear of spiders or something, something happened to you in a young childhood made you like that. That's why I had a fear of flying. Once I had that, I was like, I'm still to this day afraid of getting on a plane. I don't want to get on a plane. Guys, the reason why I'm bringing all, the, all this up is simply this. We need to have a sin phobia. Yeah. Yeah. We need to have a distinct, irrational fear of sin. And Paul says here, Flee, flee these things. You need to have a fear. Christians should have a sin phobia. If uh, you know a person that's like this lady that has a fear of snakes, there's no way you can get them around a snake. Amen? You can't get people, people that are afraid of snakes, you can't get them around snakes. And we should have a fear of sin. That that's like sin, like that snake that wrapped around that woman's arm, that black snake that coiled around her arm. You need to have a fear of sin because that sin at one time was wrapped around your soul like a black snake. And Jesus Christ came along and he took that snake and he ripped it off your soul and he took care of that sin that you might be saved and saved you from that big black snake. But Christians, unfortunately... They laugh at sin, they coddle sin, they don't have any fear of sin, and guys, we forget that that sin is what's sending us to hell if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. And we need to have a real distinct fear of sin. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We need, we need to have a sin phobia. And stop taking sin so, so lightly. That's what the world does, amen? Amen. That's why they, they have comedians make fun of sin, uh, t uh, uh, TV uh, sitcoms make fun of sin, they laugh at sin, to the point now where sin, what we, what we would call evil, they're calling good, and what we call good, they're calling evil. That's where we're at. I mean, I preach a message, I just preach the Word of God, and YouTube's kicking me off. And I'm telling you guys, you can go on YouTube and you can hear every foul word you can imagine on a YouTube channel. But I say one thing about COVID and off you go. Somebody told me, you need to be praying for YouTube. I don't have that much grace in my heart. <laughs> don't kid me, I'm no saint. You know? I should be praying for YouTube. Oh, Lord, you know, now I just can't do it. Forgive me, guys. If you think you should, y'all pray for YouTube. I don't, have, I don't have that much love in my heart to be praying for YouTube. I pray for the people who work at YouTube. I hope they get saved. I know there has to be some Christians working at YouTube, working for Google, working for these big tech places. They can't all be evil, amen? We got Christians everywhere. They might not be able to speak up, but we, we are everywhere, praise the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Look at verse 22. And then we'll, we'll get into this a little deeper before we close. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee 
Verse 22, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. This is another one. Flee also youthful lusts. Flee them. Run from them. Youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, in Paul, there's another place there in, uh, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, where Paul says, flee fornication. Because that sin's against your body. All the other sins are outside, of, again, outside the body. Fornication is a sin against your own body. And what, what he's saying, and what my point is, is I'm showing you these two or three places where Paul says flee, and it's all associated with sin, and that's really, really good advice. You need to have a sin phobia. You need to be really, really scared of sin. And when I started this sermon, I talked about all the different people I've witnessed to that's come to me and confessed to me different things. And I'm trying to tell you, everybody's sinners. Everybody's got sin. And guys, here's the scary part. Now listen to me. If you're going to listen to anything this morning, listen to this. I know people, good, godly Christians that got into sin and it killed them. I know good, godly Christians that fell into a sin and it destroyed them. It destroyed their marriage, it destroyed their job, it destroyed their career, it destroyed, destroyed their walk with the Lord. And it was over, a, and usually, I'm telling you guys, it's over usually a little sin. It's not some big sin. It's not like, oh, they got caught and they, were, they shot somebody else. No, it's a little sin, and you know what it's like with little sins? They turn into big sins. And it simply is this, and my, and my witnessing to them and talking to them and counseling with them, what I've realized is, is they didn't take sin serious. It was a joke at first. It was like, well, it's not that bad. It's just a, it's just a little snake as it's coiling around your arm about to strike you. They don't have a healthy fear of what sin can do to you in your life. The reason why Christ taught us what he taught us what he warned us about with sin was because sin is a killer. It will kill you. And we know it will send you to hell if you don't have Jesus Christ. It's sin. Why are we taking it so lightly? Why are we not afraid of it? Why don't we have a phobia of it? Why are we not scared of it? It says there to flee youthful lust. I know a guy I worked with that had a, had a distinct phobia about snakes. He was deathly scared of snakes. So we found this little cup little cup, an empty cup, and we found a little grass snake. Just a grass snake. Guy. A grass snake's not going to bite you. It looks almost like a worm. So we put the snake in this cup, and, and, and the point was, we're going to take this cup, and we're going to throw the snake on him, you know, because he's scared of snakes. Now, you see, that's not very Christ-like, is it? No, but it's funny. That's why we're going to do it. So we, we're going to do it, and, and the dad told us, yeah, he's, got to, he's really scared of snakes. So we come up there, and it, during all this process, the Holy Spirit starts working on me. You know, you can't have any fun sometimes, you know. No, don't throw the snake on him. Don't throw That's not what, would you want him throwing a, uh, an airplane on you? No, Lord. Okay, Lord. So I said, I said, hey, Peavy. His name is Daryl Peavy, friend of mine. I don't know why he's my friend. He's just, he shouldn't be, because I was going to do this to him. So he comes over there, and I, I open up the cup, and I say, hey, Daryl. And I just show him, I said, this is what we, I was just going to show him, this is what I had, and, you know, I was going to throw it at you, but this, I'm not going to throw it. This one. And I just opened the cup, and he just glanced at that cup, and he did something I'd never seen. I didn't know you could do this. I've only seen it in cartoons, where your feet move backwards real fast like this, and your arms go like that. And this is a grown six-foot-two man. This guy's like 250 pounds. I mean, this guy could whoop me in a, he just, <laughs> like that. He just, like, almost went into convulsions. And that's the first time I had, had seen somebody that had a phobia like that. Guys, I know, I, I'm not making fun of him. I'm, what I'm trying to say, that's how we should be about sin. It should scare you. You should be afraid of it. You don't want no part of it. Because you know what it does. It'll send you to hell. It will send your most loved one to hell. You know that little child you have, that you raise, that you love, that you cherish? They have sin in them, and that sin is going to send them to hell if they don't have Jesus Christ. It gets sobering when you really meditate on it. It's easy to say, yeah, that uh, way over there, they're going to go to hell with, without Jesus Christ. No, your relatives, the most dearly beloved relatives, were doomed and damned to hell if they don't have Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because of sin. It's nothing to laugh at. It's nothing to make fun of. It's something we should have a phobia of, something we should be scared of. Sin should be something you would do anything not to do. 
Right? Anything. You would do anything not to do it. I was so scared of, 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 of giving book reports to school, so when it was time for me to give a book, book report to school, what did I do? Well, I just didn't show up to school. <laughs> Amen? I just, I'm just not going to go to school. Guys, some of y'all have a fear of public speaking. And I was the same way. I just told you I was. The Lord had to break me of that. And if I said, hey, and I pointed you out, I'm not going to do it. Point you out. Next Sunday, I want you to stand up here and I want you to give your personal testimony. If I did that to some of y'all, that would be the last time I've seen you. <laughs> we'll never show back up at this church again. And I don't blame you. I would not do that to you. Why? Because I know people have a direct fear of that. And that's the kind of fear we should do. You'll do anything not to be around it. You'll do anything not to have a part of it. You'll do anything. Why? Because it'll doom your soul to hell. You should have a phobia of it. You should be scared of it. Sin should be something that you avoid those places that it dwells. Right? Those are, there's, sin should be something you avoid those places that it dwells. There's some places, Christian, you shouldn't go into because you know it's just a sinful place. I don't care if you got the Lord in you and you're saved. We know that. You say, well, I'm going to go witness to them. I'm going to go, well, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just lie to your mama. You can't lie to me. You're in there trying to have fun because you want to mix with the world. Just avoid those places. They're full of sin. What about it? Sin sends you to hell. And Jesus saves us from that. But it's a, it's a scary, sin is a scary thing. It's a destroying thing. And you should do anything to avoid it. Uh, I'm always using me as an example because I guess I'm afraid of everything. I didn't know I was afraid of heights until I went to a lighthouse in Pensacola, Florida. My wife and I went to that lighthouse, and you go to the very top of the lighthouse, and there's like this much room from like here to here, and then it's just, you know, off you go. And it had a little black railing, stood about like that tall. So I'm, I'm walking up the stairs in this lighthouse. I mean, I'm taking pictures of every, every angle because it's beautiful in there. I get to the top and walk out the thing, and like it's from here to there, and I go, oh, no, 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 I don't like that. I don't like that. I'll never forget. I was like, I mean, I literally was like, like this. And my heart's going, bum, 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 bum. and this little like 10-year-old kid goes, oh, look, mama, look over there. And I'm like, get away from the kid. Get going, get going. I don't, I don't have it. I wanted to grab that kid. You're going to fall. You're going to fall. You cannot drag me to an edge of a place now. You cannot drag me to an edge of where we're in a big tower there in Austin. And you could go to the edge and look over. My wife's over there on the fence, you know, looking at that. And I'm like way off. How's it look over there? You know, I'm like going over there. That's how sin should be in our lives. You can't drag us to a place that's got a lot of sin in it. That's how we should be. Amen. Should be, but I don't know if it is. Why is it so easy to drag us to places like that? I think it's so easy to us to get into places that are full of sin because we don't take it serious. We forget that what Jesus saved us of is what Jesus saved us from is our sins. Matthew one. Sin is something we should never play with. Sin is something we should never play with. You know, a person afraid of snakes, there's no way you can talk them into handling a snake or touching a snake. There's just no way. Or a spider, if somebody's afraid of spiders, they're not going to get nowhere near spiders. That's how we should be with sin. We should never play with it. You should be terrified at what sin can do to you and your loved ones. That's what I'm closing on. You should be terrified at what sin can do to you and your loved ones. You know, someone afraid of snakes... Someone's afraid of snakes, there's no way you can get a snake into their house. Right? If somebody's afraid of snakes, they're going to say, hey, I got this pet snake, I'm going to bring it over to your house. No, you're not going to bring it over to my house. You're going to keep that as far away as you can and don't lock the door. You're not going to get that sin, you're not going to get that in my house. But guys, that's how I am about alcohol. I don't want it anywhere in my house. I don't have alcohol in my house. I don't allow people to bring it in my house. I don't want alcohol in my house. I don't want it in my refrigerator. I've had friends come by and they're like, hey man, I, I'm, and they're just coming by to see me. It's long time childhood friends. They're like, man, I got a six pack I just bought. I don't want it to get warm in the truck. You mind if I come and put it in your refrigerator? I said, no man, I do mind. I don't want it in my house. Why am I like that? Why are you so much like that, Pastor? What's wrong with a couple of beers? Because I've seen in my ministry and I've seen before I was saved what alcohol can do to a person. And what alcohol leads a person, what alcohol can do to a life, I've seen it over and over and over to the point where I'm terrified of it. 
I don't want it anywhere near me. I don't want it in my house. I don't want to bring it in. I want it as far away as I can. Why are you being such a prude? Why are you being such a... Because I've seen it. I've seen the effects. And I know I'm one of the few preachers left that seems that preaches against alcohol, but I'm going to keep on preaching because I know what it can do. I've seen grown men crying, bawling, saying, I can't stop. I just want, I don't want to do it anymore, but I can't stop. Now, when you come with me and start dealing with men like that and women dealing with that, then you can tell me, oh, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. I, I'm worried about it because I see the sin. I see what it does, and I know what the Word of God says about it. On top of all of that, you should be, have a sin phobia. It's not unreasonable to have a sin phobia. And I think we need to have a sin phobia. You need to be more scared of sin. But the good news is, you might have a, a phobia of sin, you might be scared of sin, but the good news is, Jesus Christ delivers us from that sin. And Jesus Christ, not only He saved, when He saved us from our sins, what that means also is that we're, also, we're saved from our sins, but we're saved we don't have to commit those sins. He gives us the power to overcome those sins. You know that sin is destroying your life? Do you have a sin that you know, you could say, Pastor, I know there's something I'm doing right now that the Lord's not happy with, and it's, it's hurting me, it's hurting my marriage, it's hurting my family, it's hurting my job. It's hurt. If there's a sin like that, I'm here to tell you, with the power of Jesus Christ, He will help you break that sin. He's done it in my life. I've seen Him do, do it with multiple, multiple people's lives where they will just re give their life over the Lord Jesus Christ and they, He delivers them from that sin and it saves them and they they're not destroyed by it. And to the point to where now they hate that sin. They have a sin phobia. They don't want no part of it. Praise God. we got a Savior in Jesus Christ that saves us from our sins. And if you never don't know for sure if you've been saved from your sins, we're about to have an invitation. We'll give you an opportunity. You can walk on down this aisle, and you can, I can show you in the Bible how you can get saved, and you can walk out of this church knowing, hey, no matter what happens, I know sins in this world. I know I still have sins in my flesh, but I know that I'm saved now. I'm going to heaven, and I'm saved from my sins, and it's all because of what Jesus Christ did for me. Jesus, Jehovah, saves Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord God. I pray, Father, you bless these people, Lord. I pray the Holy Spirit will move among them, Lord God. Convict them, Lord God. If there's something you want them to straighten out, Lord God, to clean up, Lord God, that you would speak to the heart, Lord. I know you're a good father, and you're not mean about it, Lord. You're very gracious. You're very long-suffering. But, Lord, I know there's some things, Lord, I know even in my life, Lord God, that I could get better with, Lord. Help me through your Holy Spirit to do those things you want me to do, Lord God, and help me to have a healthy fear of sin, have a sin phobia, Lord God, where I'm just, I'm just frightened of it. And I want to avoid it, and I don't want to have any part of it, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord God, that if there's somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ, Lord, that they'll bow their head, Lord, they'll come on down here, they'll let me open up a Bible and show them what, the, what you have to say about getting, about getting saved, Lord, but they know that they, if, if they're underneath the sound of my voice and they can't come down the church aisle, Lord God, they can sit right there, they can bow their head, they can talk to you, Lord. Lord Jesus, and admit they're a sinner and ask you to save them, Lord God, and I know that's what you'll do. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy, Lord. Thank you for these people that love you enough to come out here this morning, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's have an invitation, bro.